define working with government systems? I think there are three challenges related to livelihood, but also to many other things. First challenge is human resources. When we are talking about scale, we are talking about 50,000 professional joining this stream to really implement the national rural livelihood mission. The second challenge is institutional capacity. So the you know, support structures that you are talking about, what is the kind of support structures that will really enable either institutions of the poor or delivery of the program or skill development to really be delivered right across the country uh, to the uh, 350 poor households. And the, and the third, I think, is which has been tackled to some extent in other sectors again, is that a program of such a scale can't be done by one kind of institution. So we need partnerships. So we need many, many, it's a multi-stakeholder program. So we need partnerships with the civil society, NGO sector, we need partnerships with private sector, and we need the government. So, and then we need the community institutions. So we, as we say, we call it public-private people partnership. So what is the model and how do you scale up these models of partnerships in this program? So these are the three areas where I think the government also finds it difficult to finance uh, where the World Bank is contributing. Uh, I think you have raised uh, some very interesting issues. But before we move to them, there is one issue that I think we need to still address. Uh, something very interesting which Vijay said was about pro-poor financial sector. Now, World Bank also is a bank, although they don't open branches in the villages, but they still are a bank which provides money. Now, the question is, how do you create a financial sector which is friendly towards the poor, especially in today's world with Basel III and all kind of norms which are floating around? and also the need for larger and larger banks to deal with the globalization and issues of that nature. Are we somewhere missing out on the poor who is sitting there somewhere in the village and only looking at the bigger picture? What is your take on that? I didn't raise the financial sector issue because they have discussed it in the last two days and there's a certain issues coming up. Essentially, we don't see this, the mission and the government financing as the end all, because we want sustainability. The community institutions which are formed need to sustain themselves. If that is so, then there's a need for a, and if you know people have to uh, get income of 50,000 per year, it's a sustained flow of credit and financial services like insurance required. Now, if you look at the picture all over India, you will see a very skewed picture, that there are some states where the both MFIs and government finance and bank finance to self-help groups is very high. While if you look at the, if you look at Bihar, you look at Jharkhand, you look at the Northeast, you find that most of the area don't have any bank branches. So there has to be a mechanism. So let me, let me, let me step in here and ask you this question. And I think it's a provocative question, so you need to answer it, uh, which is if the World Bank is asked to partner with Vijay in his quest for rolling out the National Rural Livelihood Mission. Would the World Bank be able to bring in finance with the type of flexibility which has been envisaged here as a model for other financial institutions to follow? That's the whole this, is, this is not a trick question. <laughs> Okay, I'll answer it as a non-trick question. <laughs> there, you know, there, it's a partnership. You must understand, MORD, World Bank partnership, what at this stage where we are is jointly really designing the framework of the program. Where we are looking at, you know, which are the gaps where uh, it's difficult either institutionally or financially for the government to step in, but which are required for really achieving the goals of the NRLM. Now, these are not blueprint designs. These are, when we prepare a project, there's enough, I think, potential and capacity, and I think Vijay can vouch for that in his 10 years of partnership with the bank, of how if we can really train, because, you know, it's not 
that the problem which is there today, challenge which is there today, will be there after three years. So we, all successful programs have to evolve and take into account the lessons which are learned in the previous cycle. So I think there's enough flexibility in the, in the program and also, you know, uh, there's our procedures and so on, but we are working with, within the banking system, bank system also, so for instance of contracting, of how do you get into public-private partnerships, the same problems like the government has, uh, the bank also has. So we're working to create a system which enables flexibility. So but, uh, Vipin, now, uh, how do you look at this uh, issue? Because you have worked a lot with the, uh, these kind of groups at the ground level. As, a, as an NGO, you have organized people. You also have a, another experience of having worked in a state government when you were working with this uh, Rural Non-Farm Sector Development Agency. How do you look at it? Is, do you see from where you had come that there is a major shift in the, in the environment, that it is much more conducive, that this new program which is being launched is going to be received much better at the ground level by all stakeholders, including the financial institutions? How do you look at it? perspective it looks like it's very easy and from another perspective it looks like it's very very difficult I mean if you look at the financial infrastructure in this country 80% of that is owned by the government on top of that there is a priority sector statutory obligation that all financial the banking system has uh, the major focus of the government as a part of financial inclusion is a thrust on you know putting more infrastructure in the rural areas we are now looking at uh, business correspondent model. So we're trying to look at how we are completing the full financial value chain. And largely the effort is to see how that value chain will service the poor better. So government has had all the wherewithal to make sure that the financial services flow to the poor in the manner that they need it. But if you look at how the financial sector has behaved, and perhaps not for any fault of theirs, is that um, they feel that lending to the poor is not uh, profitable, lending to the poor is risky, lending to the poor is boring, it's not fashionable, and a lot of other reasons. Uh, that could be one reason, but also once bitten twice shy. I mean, they've had a real bad experience when they were forced to lend to IRDP, where NPAs were as high as 40%, 50%, and all banks were in a real spot. spot. So that is one part of the whole thing. The other is, if you look at the current infrastructure that exists, which is in addition to the banks, what else is happening in this space of financial services provision? We have a breathtakingly fast growing microfinance institution you know, movement in addition to the SAG movement, which I think again is very good base you know, that has been created for the poor to access financial services. But in, adi in addition to that, there is a lot which is being done by microfinance institutions. They've taught us a lot of things that we should not be doing, but there are some things that they've taught us is that lending to the poor is not such a loss-making idea. So we need to look at the full ecosystem of this whole financial thing and pull out the best from those. And I think we can establish a better connect but for the financial system to respond better to the requirements of the poor, you have to prepare the poor in a manner that they are able to absorb that finance, finance and capital and be able to generate incremental incomes which help to repay the loans. We cannot, and you know that also is true for how the government looks at it. They can't afford the financial system to you know, go sick. It can't afford another 7,000 crore of you know, loan waiver. So we need to see how 70,000 uh, uh, loan waiver kind of a scenario. So we need to actually prepare the base so well and in such a robust manner that it becomes attractive for everybody to kind of look at the poor as a possible market segment. Uh, Rita, would you like to uh, respond to one point which Arvind had raised, which is that the emphasis on the agriculture-based livelihood, which seems to be emerging from here, is really not very sustainable. I, I don't think, sir, I can agree with that. In fact, if you look to see what has succeeded in improving rural livelihoods, 
it has been normally focused on the primary sector. Wherever we have taken up initiatives for livelihoods, the ones which have generated uh, higher levels of incremental income and uh, better uh, sustainable livelihoods, it has been coming from the primary sector. So I would say that that really is the way to go, and I would entirely endorse that uh, as the route. But um, to go back to the point which has just been discussed about the part financial institutions, I do feel that there is one gap, uh, and that is in designing the appropriate instruments, the appropriate lending instruments, the appropriate insurance packages, uh, which is necessary for the rural sector. So in what way do you think uh, the, uh, the instrument for lending could be tweaked to make it more... Uh, Sir, many times uh, what we are seeing is the conventional kind of loaning where we are looking at a weekly repayment. A uh, farmer has taken a loan and he is looking, facing a weekly repayment when his crop has, he has not even harvested his crop. So he takes another loan to pay back uh, the loan installments. So instruments and loan packages which are designed for the small farmer are very essential. The crop insurance packages designed for these small farmers and uh, other fa factors of vulnerability. Uh, in Vijay's presentation, he has talked about the vulnerabilities of nutrition security, health issues, things like that. Uh, so about a decade ago, when I was Secretary of Women and Child Development, I struggled with every single insurance company to find a package, uh, insurance package for Anganwadi workers which gave them maternity benefits. For the first time now, RSBY has been able to do it. In fact, probably one thing which the Livelihood Mission could look at is devising the package the way we need it and then inviting people to bid for it. Because when often we wait for the instruments which are already available and then try and uh, offer those to uh, the rural poor and it doesn't work. And then you have all kinds of defaults and uh, situations which uh, is very difficult. So I believe that this is one segment of designing the appropriate instruments, uh, both for insurance and for the credit, which should be taken up in the mission. Okay. So I think it's a very important point that she's making. One of the problems, both from the commercial banks and the MFIs, is the product packages for the poor, tailor-made to the poor, is not there. They usually have a single product. So they will have weekly repayments. Uh, when they have taken, actually, because money is fungible, they might have taken a loan which is required for the long term. So we really need to innovate and come up with a series of product packages which really is tailor-made to the needs of the poor. And that is not there in the existing banking system or existing MFIs also. Arvind, you would like to add something to that? Uh, no, sir, but uh, unless I'm uh, misunderstood, I would just like to clarify. I never said that uh, agriculture-based livelihoods are not sustainable. Rather, I wanted to drive the point that they are sustainable. But there is a lot of skepticism amongst the policymakers. That is one. Number two, sir, when we are talking about the agriculture-based livelihood, there are some policy uh, in, uh, inconsistencies. For example, uh, uh, in the morning, Dr. Dutta was telling that there is a lot of tenancy uh, uh, issues there and uh, no state revenue laws uh, do recognize, no, no state uh, law does recognize the tenancy uh, uh, per se. So there are some inadequacies in the uh, policy content which need to be addressed. Uh, 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 sir, you were just telling about the subsidy part on the loan waiver or the, in the morning we were told about the fertilizer subsidies, etc., etc. In fact, Odisha farmers can compete with Punjab farmers, but Odisha, uh, Odisha farmers cannot compete with Punjab government. I mean, the subsidies uh, across the states, they vary from uh, place to place where the minimum support price is the same for the whole country. So there are some uh, issues, bigger policy issues, maybe this is not the right forum, but I would just like to take those uh, issues when we talk about the agriculture-based livelihood, because that will hit the poor the most. But, uh, yeah, but, but I, I think uh, two issues, Vijay, that you need to address, which has emerged. One, of course, is that are we actually in NRLM veering too much towards agriculture, where we have... Uh, as the population is increasing, land is finite, productivity of land will be also increase only incrementally. To depend completely or predominantly on agriculture-based uh, livelihoods, is it really a sustainable proposition? That is one. And the second issue which has come and I think is very critical is regarding the capacities 
both in human resource, both within the government and outside, to sustain such a strategy. Would you like to say yes. something on this? I would like to supplement on the financial uh, discussions first, sir, and then take these two. I think the reason why we are going for a self-help group and federation model is the kind of flexibility that you get in developing an appropriate financial product. Uh, I think the confidence in, uh, within us and also World Bank about a, this kind of a model comes from the success that we got in Bihar, sir. Because people really gave up saying that nothing can happen there. But we found that the poorest, when they were organized, when they federated, the kind of financial products that they have innovated, and the banks are extremely happy. So they have got a health risk fund, they have got a food security fund, and they have a sort of a seed capital where they can provide on lending services to the self-help groups. So, so the need for self-help group and federations is in addition to unleashing or in addition to that solidarity is it enables financial products which are tuned to the requirements of the member. And it's also a savings-based organization. So over a period of time, the kind of savings that accumulate in self-help groups, they, there are some groups which really don't require to go outside. Ultimately, self-reliance of these institutions would come when their own financial base is so strong that they are like mini banks themselves. So that is why this whole, uh, the, the broader model, uh, universal model of women groups and their federations is A, for continuous capacity building of members as a solidarity uh, arm of the members and for innovating a variety of financial and livelihoods products. And that has been the uh, experience both in Andhra Pradesh and what, is, what gives us a lot of encouragement is that the same uh, processes when we applied in Bihar, we got the results very fast. And, that, uh, and similarly, there's a, another model which NGOs, one NGO is implementing in UP, where even without a subsidy, just through this institutional architecture, the kind of uh, results there are amazing, sir. The, the second uh, issue, sir, on agriculture livelihoods, with 58% uh, of the population dependent on agriculture, we have no choice but to first make agriculture, livestock, forestry sectors profitable. I don't think overnight we can transform these into, uh, we can shift populations into a completely non-farm situation. So, but sir, again, there's a lot of experience which shows that the smaller holdings are extremely profitable. And because it's the family's own enterprise coming in, and uh, many in the audience may be, uh, you know, may not believe it, but I have seen it where a half acre, a farmer with half acre, is able to generate net income of even 60,000 rupees. So I don't see agriculture needs to be written off. And in fact, we are looking at agriculture being a sunrise sector, a food security by the poor, rather than food security provided by FCI, how each poor family can produce, uh, provide food security for itself. So on two counts, sir. One, I agree with both Arvind and uh, Rita, madam, that agriculture is a very, is profitable and we need to work with that. And two, the sheer impossibility of wishing away 58% uh, of the population uh, from the agriculture sector. But also, sir, in NRLM, we have two streams. One is the out-migration. The youth who want to go into a different livelihood sector, there is a model of skilling them and uh, placing them outside in the semi-urban, urban areas or the industrial clusters. And the second one is through promoting micro-enterprises. Again, there is another channel. So there is a, a, a diversification, a movement, but in a very seamless and in a very uh, profitable manner, sir.
So what uh, what we hear is that uh, you are looking at three planks primarily. Exactly. Yes. One is the agriculture based livelihood. The other is micro enterprise, and the third is uh, jobs employment yeah, in, the, right. in the organized sector. Yes. yes. Uh, okay. So now just one last point yes, on capacities. Yes. I think on capacities, the the experience that we have shows that. Utilizing the community uh, best practitioners, women who have transformed their lives, best practicing farmers, if that we treat as our most important human resource, the scalability of capacity building happens differently. And the basic paradigm shift in NRLM would be that instead of the trainers going to a training institution, the training institution comes to the village. So we have the people who have solved these problems going to the villages and, uh, you know, uh, bringing about this behavioral change. But I, even then we need development professionals to catalyze this. That's a challenge. That I don't deny. There is a challenge there. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to do now is, because we're running out of time, I'm going to give exactly two minutes to each of the panelists to say anything they wish to accept criticizing the chair, and uh, you'll have to stop in two minutes. So, Vipin, you start. I endorse two, uh, two things that uh, Vijay has been saying. One is that it's an excellent idea to see how we can take SHGs to the next level in federating them. But the big challenge there is to invest a lot in capacity building, but that's well worth it. That's one, because the products will be community-oriented, there will be diversity, savings can also, you know, find some secure avenue. So that's great. Our own experience is that uh, to promote and to see outcomes in agriculture-based livelihoods promotion is much quicker. The turnaround is very quick to see results in agriculture much faster. Is that much more difficult to promote non-farm sector livelihoods. If you're looking at numbers, you can get them in agriculture much faster than you can get them in non-farm sector. But that does not mean that there is, uh, there should be no focus on non-farm sector because agriculture is going to saturate and we have to look at other options. Uh, that's the other. For me, most important within NRLM is a very strong need for convergence. Unless we don't converge with other departments, with other services, with other resources and other programs, uh, it might just be a very, you know, one-way kind of a way of doing things. So that convergence and to leverage on other things that are happening on the ground, I think, is very important. This program should not be run by the government, and government should not use other structures as delivery mechanisms. It should be done in the spirit of true partnership. There is a lot of very good experience. There is a lot of very good commitment. There is a lot of very good understanding of field realities. Uh, by civil uh, service societies. And I think uh, to use them as partners and not as de deliverers of services might be a good new way of uh, doing things. To plan and strategize and also deliver uh, on outcomes together might be a good way of looking at things. A uh, couple of ideas that come to mind recently. Uh, uh, I'd like to, uh, in fact, go further from what Vipin Bhai said. Um, we need to put a lot more partners on the table at this point where the policy is being developed. And that means the external stakeholders, financial institutions. One piece that I see uh, is very critical for us is that if we are going to make these livelihoods work, uh, neither the government, nor NGOs, nor the World Bank is actually a wealth creator. It's the markets and the private sector, which perhaps is going to be the wealth creator. So uh, in order to see that piece of it, I think we're going to have to involve the private sector and put them on the table to see what is the kind of products, what is the kind of infrastructure uh, by which uh, the livelihoods would become sustainable. So this kind of partnership also with the private sector, I believe, should be conceptualized at this point of time. Um, Sir, on the human resources, because we've talked about it several times, it's a huge challenge. Uh, number one, we need to find the funding for it. We have to recognize around this room that the, the human resources are very limited, and they, frankly, they're high-priced. So we need to fund that adequately, number one. 
Number two, I think we need to work with universities to design programs, five-year integrated programs or uh, programs which are geared to give us the kind of manpower we need. The old generation when we could do with MSWs and things like that, it doesn't work anymore. We are looking for people who can handle modern systems, MIS, accounting systems, uh, the marketplace, uh, and they're just not there. So uh, I think designing programs with educational institutions also to generate the manpower that this program is going to need uh, is another uh, issue which requires some focus. The third piece I felt uh, which appears to need some effort is if we are going to do partnerships with the private sector and public-private partnerships are being talked about, frankly, how are we equipped to support the institutions of the poor through legal and contractual frameworks that will protect their interests. At this moment, we do not have that legal and contractual strength either within the government or within the institutions we are creating to support this mission to actually create or uh, design those systems. So I think even on the legal and contractual aspects which will need to be in place for good PPP arrangements, we need to apply our minds to that. So these three ideas. Just uh, two issues, I think, as solution. I think the human resources problem is a massive training problem. So how do you train so many people? Because we can't get human resources who are ready-made. I think we need a network of institutions. We need to codify the best practices and knowledge that we have. And we need a process of certification where minimum standards are there. I think if this is done systematically, and it requires, as you said, it requires a certain amount of funding, but this is done systematically across the country, I think it is possible that if every other sector can get professionals, I think the rural development sector can get it and needs it also. The second issue, we often shy away from talking about efficiency in development programs. I think efficiency is also important in any institution. So just to give an example, we have tried to set up business standards in a lot of the projects that we are supporting of what is the time period between a proposal coming from the poor and when they receive the money. What is the time period for various uh, uh, from, uh, say, commitment to finance to getting the check. Because this becomes very important for the poor. And one of the lessons we have also learned is that here, this is where technology needs to come in. So we need to leapfrog into technology which can transfer funds fast to the community groups which are formed, uh, transfer funds not through various channels of people so that you know, rent-seeking behavior doesn't come in. Uh, so there's you know, now mobile banking, mobile technology, electronic transfer. When we started in Bihar, we, you won't believe we had a problem that the checks which, which you go from the state to the district and district to the community Two is to take 45 minute, uh, days. Two so minutes. we need to cut that short. So efficiency is an issue. Arvind. Two minutes. In one minute, and that is that beyond the livelihood component, this uh, Im uh, important component of uh, this uh, placement uh, that sir was talking about, the skill upgradation and placement thing, that would be a very good component in the NRLM. I think we should uh, also uh, focus on that. Okay. Last word to you for two minutes. Yes. I, I think the challenge of scale. So it's not a program which will be rolled out in all the villages in one go. It will be done very intensively. We would like to follow a ripple model. So where the best practicing locations uh, become the basis for transforming neighboring areas. And again, people from among the poor are the ones who lead this transformation. So that is how the NRLM would be different from the, the previous uh, program. Uh, <clears throat> I think we have had an extremely rich discussion here and a large number of issues have been thrown up. There are challenges, but I think there are also answers. And of course, no one is denying that it would require tremendous effort 
and yet there is this uh, belief that uh, we can put in that kind of effort and this program can be successful. So we have now 15 minutes for question answers, which means that uh, we want very clear questions. Please no uh, long comments, etc., because there isn't enough time, and more people can then ask questions. So when